thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you for those online who are watching. Um, so I'm here with Yulia Shikolba. Speak up, louder, okay. I'm here with Yulia Shikova, um, who uh, joins us from HALO, uh, which is uh, an explosive ordnance education and uh, demining uh, humanitarian organization. Um, Yulia has started with HALO since May this year, um, but before working with HALO has had extensive humanitarian experience in a number of different contexts. Um, so she's worked, begun her career in Ukraine, as I understand, and then moved to uh, Kabul, and then later to Iraq, and most recently to Syria. So we're gonna kind of talk a little bit about those experiences, but also primarily about uh, the work in Ukraine. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, I'm very happy to take questions. Uh, I know that we have Q&A in the end, but there will be specific topic on uh, terms and definitions in my action. And if you have questions on that topic, ask them before then, because all the discussion will not make much sense for you <laughs> without clarification of these terms. Very good point, yes. Um, so yeah, we'll be talking for 90 minutes about, also just a reminder that we are here in a humanitarian context. Um, so we're primarily gonna be talking within a space of uh, humanitarian neutrality. Um, and otherwise, uh, we'll be kind of focusing immediately on, as you said, the terminology, the terms, the references. So please jump in then. Um, and then we'll have a kind of, I think it's a 45 minute discussion where we're gonna look at uh, what is the current situation in Ukraine? Uh, what is mine action? Um, what is mine action in Ukraine? What's the scale? What's the challenges? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the lessons from other conflicts um, based on Yulia's extensive experience. Um, and then finally, we'll have a little bit of a reflection on who are the people who are doing this kind of work um, and how do you recruit from these settings? Um, and especially in your work kind of on all these different contexts, how do you make sure that the lessons learned with that kind of team management uh, go across? And that's within 45 minutes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll manage, we'll manage. Um, the event will be put online, so just everyone knows that. Um, and yeah, huge thanks to the Ukrainian Institute for having us, um, and thanks for inviting us here today. So, shall we begin? Yeah. Yeah? So, maybe can you just take us into Ukraine for a moment? So what is the conflict looking like today? Where are the different areas of control? What scale are we talking about in terms of civilian harm? Um, and what's changed in the past few months? Yeah, I think here I will ask Kalesia to put map. <laughs> Always good to uh, start with the map when we talk about Ukraine, for sure. Yeah, it's important to have it in yeah, front yeah. of your eyes. So when we are talking about civilian harm in Ukraine, it's very important to understand that if we are talking about the scale as of 24th of February, the information is poor, bad, incomplete, not verified, and uh, like it's going to be reviewed in future. Like OHCHR, uh, one of the UN agencies who monitor like civilian harm in Ukraine, they basically estimate that around 11, uh, mil 11 million civilians uh, are at risk of explosive ordnance. And uh, like you have to understand that it's a big difference between, um, between what we calculate in HALO and what um, other agencies calculate as civilian harm. So um, as of now, we recorded, as of last week, that's an updated map, we recorded from open source uh, around, not around, basically 93 accident and 75 people killed, 108 people injured. But it is only from explosive ordnance, landmines, and other explosive stuff, which is on the ground. It's excluding these casualties that come from shelling, that come from uh, artillery strikes, air strikes, and so on and so forth. So now majority of casualties in total come from air strikes, uh, from use of explosive violence in populated areas, cluster munitions. Um, yeah, pretty devastating situation. At the same time, in Halo, we don't focus on that part. So we are very much focused on uh, removing what, what is left after that strikes. Uh, in terms of contact lines, I mean, you can see the map. Basically, um, the conflict is very, 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 very active. So you can't say that it's frozen or slowed down. It's slowed down a bit, that's true. Um, the lines of control has changed. Uh, if you look at the north of the country, with like a lot of casualties around Kiev region, 
it's mainly into the areas where uh, which were liberated recently uh, by Ukrainian army um, and this is the areas of particular concern because a lot of booby traps a lot of unexploded ordnance landmines left there civilians are coming back and which causes us a lot of casualties so we are not definitely the only one who is tracing casualties. You can look for Bellingcat, Aklet Data, and, uh, and, and many other organizations. The, the data will be different. So there is no good data in the process of the conflict. Like um, OECHR was writing about more than 10,000 uh, people became a victim of war. But it's excluded Mariupol, excluded Severodonetsk, because nobody really calculated casualties there. Thank you, and I think that gives us a small indication into the complexity of the information as well. Um, maybe, as we're, I can see, we're already getting there a little bit. Let's discuss some of that terminology. So okay. your, your official lead is Explosive Ordnance Risk Education Lead, right? Yes. <laughs> your official name. So what does that actually mean? What is Explosive Ordnance? And connected to that, what is HALO's work primarily in Ukraine on this issue? So look, there are several, um, as of our concerns, there are several types of explosive hazards for civilians. First, and like where humanitarian mine action started in 1988, is landmines. Landmines can be anti-tank or anti-vehicle, depends how you call them, or anti-personnel. It's regulated by several different conventions, anti-personnel landmine ban convention, you have like amended protocol two to conventional and conventional weapons, very like legalized conventional mines. They are not the primary hazard in Ukraine right now. There are some, there are many actually, but they're not primary hazard. Um, another important things which we are dealing with is unexploded ordnance. So if I will say UXO at some point, please correct me because I tend to do that. So what is unexploded ordnance? When the any artillery or rocket or mortar or air bomb was dropped, shelled, fired, or hand grenades thrown, but didn't explode as intended. All this weapon, majority of them, uh, designed to explode upon impact or near impact or whatever, but like they, they designed to explode more or less immediately. Some of them do not. Some of them fail to detonate. And these things stay in the earth more or less forever. In Ukraine before 2014, we had more than 200 casualties from the Second World War, uh, unexploded ordnance. So you have to be mindful that the, it's a huge number of ordnance. Like considering that we use both sides, basically use Soviet bad, really poorly made weapon, like the percentage of failure can go up to 30%. So you can imagine it's thousands and thousands of rockets, artillery, shells, like any kind of mortars, fired like, I would say daily, weekly, and 30% of them statistically may be not detonated. So it's a huge amount of work. Cluster munition, uh, it's important subgroup within unexploded ordnance. Some of them designed to detonate after some period of time, some of them not, but they are basically very small, very sensitive uh, pieces of ordnance that some of them look like a you know, Coca-Cola can and kids and not kids, picking them up, explode in hand. So this is the main like hazard part. If you have any questions, please raise them. Um, Important part about mine action. So humanitarian mine action in principle is very different from military demining. Mm -hmm. So if we imagine the troops are moving forward and there are engineering units who support these troops and they need to make sure that troops can move from A to B, they would not demine the whole minefield in front of them. They will probably make a short passage to make sure the troops are moving. It's not always the case but the idea behind it is like that. Which means that the whole minefield which is out of this passage stays dangerous for civilians for years and years after the conflict. Like we have a huge programs of demining in Afghanistan still since 1988 where we started as humanitarian. We have a huge, huge still, now a bit less, but still big programs in Cambodia, for example, with unexplored ordnance. 
and it's been like, you know, a while ago, it's not a fresh conflict. So yeah, humanitarian mine action, it's not only demining. Humanitarian mine action has five core pillars. One is actual demining, and again, demining is not just demining. <laughs> it's survey, it's clearance, you can clear with mechanical assets, you can clear with dogs, rats occasionally. Uh, you can clear with deminers like manpower, hands, in a way, with equipment. Um, at the same time, to find the mine is actually the most important task, because if you know for sure where is a mine, it gets pretty easy. But to find the mine, we have different techniques, different type of survey, I'll not go into these details, definitely, but um, it's a huge work. Uh, we have a small part, not a small, now it's Ukraine, it's gonna be actually pretty big, um, explosive ordnance disposal. So again, if I would say EOD, please, please <laughs> correct me. But basically it's, I would say a bit more advanced. It's, it deals basically with demolition of unexploded ordnance and landmines. So it's, it's a very technical specialty field. So yeah, this is my uh, terminology. <laughs> if anyone had question on terminology, it might be confusing, but I tried to make it very simple. Uh, but that's important thing to understand moving forward. No, I think that's really clear. And I mean, one of the really challenging things is that the terminology in the humanitarian world can be quite insular and quite complex, but that was a really, uh, a very clear explanation. And I think maybe part of that is because a lot of your work is in education on those explosive ordnance. So maybe could you talk a little bit about what that looks like as well? Yeah, so I mentioned that we have five pillars in mine action. One of them is very important demining, and we have to understand that it's a core of mine action. So like we are focused on demining, and I believe myself that it's one of the best humanitarian activities because, you know, people were suffering. You remove mines, people are not suffering. It's not the same if you try to fight the world hunger. But like, um, another four pillars is basically uh, explosive ordnance risk education, that's what I do. So demining is lengthy process. We started it in 1988 in Afghanistan, we're still doing it. So while all of these years are coming, people should behave safer in order not to become a casualty. So important thing about explosive ordnance risk education, or like before it was called mine risk education, <laughs> But uh, important, important, important point is that it's basically behavioral change communication science. It has very little to do with actual ordinance. It has much more to do with people and their behavior and their behavioral preference and enabling the safer behavior preference. So I would compare explosive ordinance risk education much more uh, to, I don't know, the campaigns how to abolish uh, child marriage or how to fight, uh, you know, how to reduce number of smokers, basically, if you compare it. You know, we do try to inform people that, you know, smoking is bad for your health. For years and years, there are still quite a lot of smokers. We do tell people, you know, cross the street on a green light. You know, in the UK, it's not the case, clearly. But, um, so, it's much more to deal with behavior, just to tell people, you know, don't touch minds, unfortunately. We would like it to work, it doesn't. So there are other ways, persuasive communication, other campaigns that we are trying to do. It's not 100% success, but it helps us to, to reduce number of people who become a casualty. And as it, three things I'll just touch very briefly. One is victim assistance, so we already see it in Ukraine, but we, we see it all over the world because after the war, when the explosive ordnance stay there, a lot of people become a casualty. And what is casualty from, from explosive ordnance? Often it's either dead person or like heavily, heavily injured main person without legs or hands, handicapped person. So basically it's very important to support these people and for them to become, reintegrate them in the community and for them to become a part of community again. So this is victim assistance. Advocacy, stockpile destruction, I'll just deliberately will not touch it, but basically um, there are also important pi <laughs> pillars of mine action, but they are like, um, we don't have stockpile destruction in Ukraine at all uh, for very obvious reason, but, uh, and advocacy in terms of conventions, if you are interested, we can address it in Q&A. Okay. So we're getting a sense that demining is not just demining, essentially. essentially. <laughs> There's a huge kind of broad thing around yeah. this. I'm actually kind of interested in the, the behavioral change 
activities just for a minute without getting too derailed, but maybe could you give us an example of what that looks like? I mean, are you interviewing families? Are you sending, uh, are you doing focus groups? Are you kind of holding community leaders in certain areas? Like, what does it look like in, in practice uh, at the moment? I often like, you know, I'm in a very interesting position because I am Ukrainian and I started my career in Ukraine. And I'm at the same time uh, come from a background of international. And uh, when you say community leaders in Ukraine, <laughs> you get community leaders in Ukraine. It's like, it's, it's interesting. Uh -huh. uh, like, but with a functional state and established network of government and uh, civil society, it's not necessarily should be the biggest tree in the village where you get together the oldest man in a village, which you might do in some countries actually. But uh, yeah, uh, it looked very differently. So it started from uh, communication, like public information dissemination. So we have challenges in TikTok, you know, for mm -hmm. example. We have um, several resources, websites. Um, we as humanitarian mine action community in Ukraine, not only we as Halo. But um, we have online courses, uh, we have different types of uh, games for children, for example. Mm -hmm. We have uh, communities integra uh, activities integrated in school, um, with school age children, with some summer camps. We uh, collaborate with the government and especially with uh, educational authorities to, to go there and uh, to educate teachers, especially on the areas which were like retaken and, uh, and, and need more risk education. I'll explain later why you will probably see on the map. But um, yeah, so it, it involves focus group discussion and a lot of attempts to measure how successful we are or not successful. But it's, uh, it's always very difficult to measure something that did not happen, right? Mm. So one thing is you measure the effectiveness uh, of, I don't know, digging the hole on the ground but to measure effectiveness of preventing someone jumping into this hole if nobody jumped. That's, that's a challenge. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a variety of activities. It's a lot of uh, going to the communities, a lot of uh, talking to people, community liaison, and of course, um, a lot of work with the government. And government, I can say, it's doing a fantastic job. Like within the first, um, within the first literally days after the conflict started again in on 24th of February. Conflict didn't start on 24th of February at all, but like uh, with the escalation, uh, our state emergency service and an SMS campaign, for example, every single Ukrainian received an SMS, please don't touch landmines basically. Mm -hmm. And don't touch everything, you don't understand what it is. So there are a lot of activities, but there are a lot of work to do. Ukraine is a huge country. We started Explosive Ordnance Risk Education in 2015 in Donbas. And, uh, you know, yet not all people were trained back then. But now it's actually playing, <laughs> I don't want to find the silver lining in all of this, but a lot of people who were displaced from Donbas, Mariupol, Severodonetsk, um, or like areas around Donetsk Oblast, they actually know much better about the explosive ordnance and those who, for example, spend all, the, all their life in Kiev. I think it'd be interesting just to talk a bit about that because you were working in Ukraine before and as you said, you know, this is not, it's a fresh version of the conflict, but it's an escalation. It's not something new that Ukraine has never seen before. So maybe could you just touch upon what did demining in Ukraine look like before that? How has it changed? And what's the scale of the challenge that you're seeing now? Huge. <laughs> uh, well, so just for your understanding, like traditionally humanitarian mine action, again, traditionally, it never happens in real life, but in a textbook, it's a post-conflict activity, demining. So fighting stopped, all, all sides, everything stopped, and now we start to clear land. In practice, you, you barely find a country where it actually happens like this. Maybe, I don't know, Cambodia is a good example, but I've been Afghanistan, fighting here, demining there, ongoing. Syria, very ongoing. Like uh, Iraq, m more or less same. You never have an, uh, this ideal status quo when you're, okay, peace accords, everyone happy, everyone shaking hands, and now we start demining. Never happens really. Like, okay, happens very occasionally. Mm. And Ukraine is not the case. So um, therefore, um, since 2015, 16, like many organizations started doing an actual like clearance in Donbass area far from the contact line back then, 
relatively far, but still the Netsk Luhansk Oblast, but it's still, it was a lot of agricultural land which were leased for farmers where you can, they can you know, actually resume their farming activities. Um, it breaks my heart now because uh, like one of the organizations which I started was Danish Demining Group and uh, they did a demining settlement called Myrna Dolina in Lohansk region and yeah, and I just read uh, several days ago a news that it was recontaminated and uh, another like civilian uh, died there basically. Mm -hmm. So you see there is always a huge risk in an active conflict or frozen, how you call conflict, because it can always become not frozen. So it is, it is tricky. Um, difference, so good thing, but again, silver lining, <laughs> good thing that we had more or less several established organizations in the country. So by the time, by the 23rd of February, we had Danish Demining Group working in Ukraine, we had Halo Trust working in Ukraine, we had uh, FSD, uh, Swiss organization working in Ukraine. I'm not sure I remember the French name correctly. So we had someone and we had a couple of like developing national organizations, which is very good um, because it shows that there are local capacities that are going there. They're on a very small scale. They're not yet doing the mining, but, but, but it's good opportunity. Um, now we have entering basically all mine action organizations, in, well, all international mine action organizations I know, almost all of them, uh, humanitarian ones are entering the country, which is fantastic because the scale is amazing. Like, it's really impressive in a very bad way, but it's still impressive. Like, you have, there are estimates, which I strongly disagree with, but uh, there are estimates that approximately half of the territory requires survey. That's important part. And uh, when you look at the news, because when I was preparing to this chat, I was looking at the news and I was like, half of Ukrainian territories is contaminated by explosive ordnance. That's not quite accurate because half of Ukrainian territory, so that you understand, it's more or less territory of Germany. And it's not the case that we have to, you know, dig and make sure that all the Germany has the best agricultural land ever uh, after this digging. Um, so that's not the case, but it requires survey because where they were strikes, remember statistics, up to 30% becomes unexploded ordnance. Yeah, sorry, unexploded ordnance here. So, but yeah, um, so it is, it, it is very important to make sure that we don't have um, unsurveyed territory. But if you can see, even on the map you can see, you can see that the north where, where there was like very active conflict it is definitely contaminated, particularly the north, like liberated areas. You have a lot of um, surprises left and, and everything. You have a lot of, maybe you saw this, a lot of nice pictures of uh, destroyed tanks and everything in Ukraine. It's very problematic when, uh, when citizens try to have a tractor who is dragging them out because some of them can be dangerous, some of them can be booby-trapped, some of them can, be, can have uh, unexploded ordnance inside. So it is now the scale is immense comparing to what it was. It's just immense and it's just everywhere. It feels like it's everywhere because before, you know, you work in Donbass, it was more or less contained. It was very clear where and how it was relatively, you know, you know the context. Now after the missile strikes or air strikes or particularly artillery strikes, everything is contaminated heavily. Plus you have now all this red parts, basically um, a very active conflict now on east and south. So it's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be very challenging work in terms of context because you can't wait until full peace accords uh, complete, like absolute, I don't know, end of war and, uh, and, uh, and cessation of any hostilities because civilians are dying every single day. So, and people particularly, we have a problem with people on the move. Mm. So people are returning massively now to Kiev and around, Sumy and around, even like some even returning to Kharkiv. Like if you look at the, at the movement of population, like yeah, we have a lot of population moving out of the country, but now a lot of them are coming back. And uh, they are coming back, they don't know the context, they don't know where strikes were, like they don't know who was in their house, what did they leave there. So it's a, it's a huge challenge for returning population. 
And maybe, I mean, you're saying there's lots of humanitarian mine action, there's also the military activities which are doing the mine action, but now with the kind of conflict changing, people on the move coming back, I mean, what is the biggest challenge you would say in order to get those, or is it even possible to estimate to get those surveys done to start the clearing and the education? So it's, it should be a bit of a balance because uh, yes, we need information, we need information fast, Good thing is that now we have a new technology. Yeah, survey now doesn't necessarily look like going into community and talking. You can do a lot with uh, open source, <laughs> open source intelligence, and 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 all of this thing. You can do mapping. There are again Bellingcat. There are like like maps. Um, a lot of organizations doing similar mapping like this from open source. Um, at the same time, it's not good enough for actual clearance. So you will still have to go in, in the community and do non-technical survey, basically talking to people and then technical and then actual clearance. Um, big challenge now is to start it, you know, right and coordinated because I might be lying here, but like I don't remember, it was three or four big landmine impact survey in Afghanistan done. So basically every time you redo it, it's a massive resources. Like, when I was in Iraq, there were at least two survey was going on and people already saying that we need another one. So like it is, it is time and money consuming activity and for explosive ordnance particularly, it's, it's challenging. You have to know where they are. People have to know where they are. You have to have specific equipment, trained personnel to do the surveys. And the biggest problem is coordination because when you have a lot of actors and all of them are doing something and it's not very well coordinated, of course it's a challenge. In theory, in Ukraine, we have um, National Mine Action Authority, which is Ministry of Defense. We have uh, two mine action center, maybe two and a half, which is uh, very unique. I never saw in any other country in the world more than one mine action center. Uh, but uh, we have several, which is, on the one hand, it's blessing because both of them are doing humanitarian mine action either it's military or it's um, a state emergency service. And the scale is so big and the, the clearance is so fast and the dedication of these people is massive and, and, and really good. At the same time, there is not enough um, authority and um, not enough willingness, time, uh, capacity for coordination. So we don't, I'm, like I would be really careful now with all the non-technical surveys that are going on like, I wouldn't be very confident to say that, okay, we are not surveying one land five times and another land never. So it's mm. And you've kind of alluded to this, and like, as I said, you know, you have so much experience. I think in Afghanistan, you're in one of the biggest kind of personally learned from those contexts. What are you seeing repeat itself again in Ukraine? And what are you seeing that maybe the humanitarian community or, or anyone who's kind of involved in this could perhaps do better? Yeah, I mean, there are always things that you can do better. <laughs> so I will probably start with a, like strengths of Ukrainian mine action program in general, comparing to any else, and literally any program else. So it's very hard to compare my experience in Afghanistan to my experience in Ukraine, because in Afghanistan, 37% of population are literate. Like your approach to explosive ordnance risk education is very different. In Ukraine, it's like, I googled it, 99.7, and it's more than in the UK. So the literacy level is like immense. The population is pretty educated. The population uh, has a lot of um, ha has a lot of agency towards their action, which is very good, because it's not the case in many other countries. Um, so important thing is for us as international organizations not to forget and um, not not to replace the functioning government structures i would say but also not to replace the functioning community structures but to build on them because like it is the case um, i hope it's going to be less and less but it is the case that new organization come into the country new people even come into the country and they're like okay Last time I was in South Sudan and they did it like this and it worked. So, and, and this was, it's anecdote, but it's basically, it was, we did it, uh, we faced it in uh, 2016 when one of the ladies who were organizing livelihood program suggested to organize a distribution under the biggest tree in a village in Ukraine. Who of you know Ukraine? Like, it's not how we 
get together. <laughs> we have, you know, usually like government building, school, we, we really have facilities. So, um, and this is a bit of a challenge here because, and it's different in a way, but this attitude is harmful in any country. Like, I just, just to give a dis disclaimer, like one size fits all, it doesn't work in, in humanitarian sector. Uh, but like, it's very important to make sure that you build on existing capacity, that you empower and enhance the capacities that are on the ground, not replacing them. Because it's, it's, a, it's a danger that a lot of humanitarian action unfortunately get in there. Um, important lesson from Syria for me, because in a many ways, and I will not dig into it, but it's a, very, it's a similar context in many ways. And uh, in terms of uh, scale of contamination, in terms of type of contamination, in terms of actual ordnance that are there, it's, it, it, it resembles. So what I kind of learned and uh, figured out in Syria is that risk avoidance is not working because the scale of contamination is so massive that the only thing, the, the best thing that you can do for population is to teach them some risk management approaches and it's not going to be avoidance. So there is, there is never going to be zero tolerance to risk. Like I'll explain basically. Mm -hmm. So in Ukraine to start any um, reconstruction and rebuilding, we're all talking about this reconstruction programs and, and building and whatever. It's, it, it's impossible without humanitarian mine action, without actual demining. At the same time, rubble removal, you can't have zero risk. So you can teach your rubble removal workers or people who do that job, you can teach them recognition, you can teach them uh, safety rules, you can teach them whatever, you can use machine, but they will be never zero risk. So there is something that we have to accept. Um, Ukrainian government face like a lot of criticism in the way they do demining, and I fully stand behind it because they don't necessarily do in accordance to international mine action standards. They do it in a very unsafe way to their staff. They basically just pick up the things and throw in the back of the truck, which is definitely not how you should do it. And they lost quite a lot of personnel by now. But at the same time, like as Ukrainian, I'm thinking um, how much time will it take for us if we do everything as per the standards in this emergency? How many civilians will die before basically it's all gonna pick up? It's, it's a long discussion, but um, basically it's very important to empower, like, empower communities to make an informed decision about the risks that they're gonna take or not take, because there is no chance to say like, just no, just you don't go to this area at all, and that's people's home, and they can't really not go in there. So risk management should be much, more, much less risk averse, I would say, unfortunately. But uh, it's it's important part. Um, yeah, uh, strategy I already mentioned it. Like country should have a country level strategy, and this strategy should basically inform what we are doing on the ground, and what go what other organizations are doing on the ground. Um, another important part is a like knowledge management and uh, like knowledge management and knowledge transfer from staff to staff. And like you do understand that how humanitarian sector works. You have uh, international staff which is coming to the country, staying there for a year or two, and leaving the country. And it's local staff who is basically staying forever, and they, they are this institutional knowledge. And it's very important to make sure that they don't receive the new messages or new, absolutely new ideas every time the international staff is rotating. So yeah, there are a lot of things, uh, there are a lot of things that could be, let's say, um, replicate it or learn from other con contexts, but it's very important not to replicate it because it's just, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and maybe, yeah, on that last point, because I think what, I mean, part of what you're saying is that, you know, the personnel who are actually doing a lot of the mine clearance are the ones most at risk in, in many of the programs, and you have to manage that as a manager. You, you know, you can't completely tell them that they're not able to go into those places or do the work that, that they're meant to be doing. And I know that a lot of what Halo does and other, other actors as well is kind of look at who is in the local community, especially from a gender perspective, and say, how can we empower, say, women in this area to get involved in these programs as well? So maybe could you tell us a little bit about that gender work, but then also how you manage the, the related risks and knock-on effects as well? Look, I, 
if humanitarian mine action, if humanitarian demining is done as per the standards, uh, as per all of the international mine action standards requirement, because it's very regulated work, so we have the set of standards, you can Google them online, they are even translated, some of them translated to Ukrainian even now. Like, it's, it's a fantastic set of documents that guides the whole humanitarian sphere. You have similar things in protection and other things, but they are not uh, binding in majority of cases, while in mine action, people adhere to IMAS always. Um, and when you do it as per the standard, you're actually pretty safe. So the SOPs are in place, training is in place, quality management is in place. The job for deminer in the field who is doing actual demining with adherence of all the procedures is, I would say, fairly safe. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing to be scared. It's not like risking life. Another thing that people in, um, in the government sector and military, they don't do it normally, necessarily, as per the, all the safety standards that they have. Uh, they know about them, but, you know, there is a situation, an emergency. Um, with, with this said, people who are doing rubble removal, they're not deminers, and you can't make them deminers, and, like, there are techniques, and there's, like, you need machines, it's, it's a lot of things. So they're basically people who are non-deminers, who are from the community or from construction company or whatever, and they have to understand the risk. At the same time, they have to understand the risk, but they have to understand the benefits and the future benefits of doing this specific job. But um, this is important balance to, so to would navigate. They be, so the kind of rubble, this is a stupid question, but imagining that there was a kind of, say this room was, there was some event that happened here and then there was rubble here, but then also some area that had to be, uh, you knew there was an ex unexploded ordinance over there. So in terms of your team, would you bring in the deminers to get rid of that bit and then you would have different people doing the rubble removal who are not... Look, it's just all happens in parallel. Like, when we are talking about demining in Ukrainian humanitarian actors, they are mainly now focused not on rubble removal, not on urban clearance. They are mainly now focused on agricultural land, for example, mm -hmm. because it's also super important because, you know, we had this uh, big thing with the grain and the Ukrainian being a bread basket. I don't like this word, but anyway, bread basket for a whole, like, a, lot, a fairly big part of the world. And, like, it's a very interesting point. We are now, we are, side note, we are taking this grain out, but like without actual clearance of the land, next year we will face the same situation. It's going to be the same uh, African countries who are now demanding this, this, this bread, basically. So um, agricultural land demand is very important. Rubble removal is done by so many things, so many people. So I come home to, let's say, Bucha, and I see my home destroyed, would I do something about it? Like, I, even if I am informed, and that's the same, but like, that's my home, and under there, I don't know, I have uh, memories of my, I don't know, wedding. And it's very important to, um, to inform people about that risk and to offer them other solutions, but ultimately, we have uh, these volunteering groups of youth who are basically going there, putting, nice music and removing rubbles, which is super dangerous. But like, would they stop if we just say them? They wouldn't. Like the best we can do is just to inform them about the risk and say like, if you see this, please call uh, 101, please call SESO and they will p come and pick it up. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, it's very different in terms of context. Like in Syria, when the cities are destroyed, specific cities, it's easy, they just closed the city for the last seven years. Some of them are completely closed and basically shut everyone who tried to get in. Can you do it in democracy like Ukraine? You can't, you can like persuade people not to, you can advise them, you can suggest, but you can't fully stop them from doing that. So it's, it's a lot of things. Rubble removal, it's a lot done with municipality workers, for example, or like um, this electro network, whatever workers. And like, it's their job to do that. They have to be informed, they have to, but they're not deminers. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is tricky. I, in ideal situation, we do have uh, SESU and deminers from SESU like searching specific areas, enabling return, but they are so few <laughs> and the need is so dramatic, that's why, that's where the casualty also happen. But on the other hand, I can, again, we can't measure what didn't happen, right? How many they prevented. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is important distinction. Uh, when, we, when it comes to our recruitment, gender is an important part. 
Um, oh. So my action in general is traditionally pretty male dominated world. At the same time, this being said, we made a lot of progress. And I think it's one of the most empowering, um, it's one of the most empowering jobs basically in the humanitarian sector as a woman you can have. I'm biased, of course. Uh, but I think like we have, uh, we had a female demanding teams in Afghanistan. We have a quite extensive uh, gender like women program in Iraq. Uh, especially we as humanitarian community depends with which organization I was working. But uh, um, we had like uh, women policemen, uh, police women uh, trained in, in, in Iraq on um, explosive hazard first responders, whatever. But in Ukraine, it's very interesting because on the one hand, it's like much better than in any other country where I worked. We had a female prime minister once. Everyone says to me that we don't have problem. We do have problem a lot. But at the same time, we don't need to go and recruit all female teams because they can't work with men. We don't need to hire Mahram, which is like male chaperone for female just to travel with someone in a car if they go to the community to deliver some risk education, right? So there are, there are a lot of things that are better and there are a lot of things that are worse. So I can say that we are now pretty struggling with recruiting the female staff as deminers because in the mentality of average Ukrainian citizen, deminer, and you know in Ukrainian uh, language we have feminine forms of words and masculine forms of words. And D minor is definitely not a feminine. Like the first time you hear it, it's not a feminine one. And uh, and now we actually come up with a <laughs> feminine oh, yeah? form. I mean, we didn't invent it ourselves. It's a pretty obvious decision. But at the same time, it's a, it's a need. Mm. Like we have statistics, we have research that women are in no way worse D minors than men. In some contexts, they are particularly better, but again, that's per perpetrating gender stereotypes. But uh, in Ukraine now, it's um, it's several aspects to it. First of all, uh, men get conscripted, women don't, and uh, I know that we have a huge percentages of Mikhail personnel who is now, um, I mean, they are not actually in the field. Um, at the same time it's very hard to break this stereotype that this is an ex-military man job. And uh, we are doing, we are doing, we are making progress again. So we now post uh, all our adverti job advertisement with a big disclaimer that no prior military experience is needed. We teach everything. So that's a whole approach of Halo. We basically train person from, from zero to hero. And then we monitor them in the field, we equip them with, a, with the right training, with the right knowledge, with the right follow-up, with the right quality, quality assurance, quality control, uh, with a certain examination and so on, and, and capacity, and it's like ongoing process. So we don't need people with military experience. If they have military experience, it's good. But I mentioned in the very beginning that military demining and humanitarian demining is fairly different things. And, uh, and you have to keep it in mind. So now we have a lot of women who are IDPs, for example, uh, or who lost their husbands due to war, or who lost their, not lost, who, whose husbands are like serving in the army, for example. And it is a, you know, you can feel everyone has someone who has someone, you know? So it's a, it's a fairly big percent of population which is in need for jobs, and we provide these jobs. We now growing like, uh, Halo is growing on a, unprecedented scale because to address the need and no, that's not the map anymore but uh, like yeah to address the need in particular regions at the same time um, we try to do better because so far uh, when you just put an announcement without any explanation you would have probably 10 percent of women applied 90 percent will be men because d minor the first association I, I believe in in the uk it's going to be more or less the same to yeah. be fair like, I don't think it's gonna be a very, the first thing that you imagine is like a nice lady doing the clearance, uh, not the case. But, um, so we're now working on it. 
um, Halo is trying to reach out to the female networks, to the female NGOs, to, to, to promote through our networks, because like all of us female Ukrainians have some kind of networks trying to explain that, you know, that's actually possible. We go into the community, our women deminers speak to the population, and for demining it's important, but it's even more important for survey and explosive ordnance risk education, because if you, as a survey, is a, as a one type of survey, you also go to the community and talk to people. And like, you have to be aware of biases, right? So men would ask certain questions, women would ask certain questions, men would ask certain people. It can be trained, it can be overcome, but we have to acknowledge that this bias often exists and we have to find a way to get the best information we can. So with risk education, again, another thing. We are not in the context of Afghanistan where only women can talk to women. So this is easy in Afghanistan. You have to have a women trainers because nobody can talk to women as a, as a man. In Ukraine, of course, it's not the case. But at the same time, there are different aspects and dynamics. So yeah, we are, we are definitely trying to do as best as we can. And I think our like, gender balance rate is now kind of improving. Like, overall, within an organization, we have around 30% of women. Uh, but you have to look at the specific jobs that they are doing. That's also important. We have a female program manager which is fantastic. Um, we have a lot of senior female staff, so it's not just, you know, secretary preparing coffee, women, everyone else is men, uh, not the case. So we are doing a lot of progress. But at the same time, Ukraine is, um, I don't want to say that it's deeply patriarchal country, but in uh, many ways it unfortunately is. And it's not halo job to fight this dynamics, but yeah. we can contribute um, throughout our staff, throughout our input. And I think that's a right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, I think of all of the things you've talked about, taking on the patriarchy at the same time is kind of uh, a big one. Um, I know we're kind of short on time, so I just wanted to just hold it there for my set of questions um, and just thank you so much. I mean, that was extremely clear. Uh, you've taken us through this kind of very complex world um, and also given us an idea of the kind of yeah, realities and the challenges um, and the things that we should and shouldn't learn from the other conflicts as well. Um, so yeah, just big thank you to you and then I'll hand over to the audience for any questions. Yeah. Oh, I was so clear that there are no questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a question behind? Yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead. <laughs> There are no silly questions. <laughs> I'll start with a silly one. Maybe it's not so silly. Um, but I think a lot of us will follow uh, social media, uh, various groups and accounts will know uh, the dog Buffalo, <laughs> the bullet, <laughs> the lovely dog, the D-Minder, uh, who's become like, extremely uh, famous uh, in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the, the dog and how you and then I understand that I think the reason why this little character, super cute uh, animal exists, <laughs> is partly to draw people's attention to the problem, right? So as uh, you know, you talk about how hard or challenging it can be to reach out to people and uh, you know explain these problems to them. Does something like that work, especially with young people, especially with social media, <coughs> yes, so, uh, Instagram account? Uh, follow it if you're on Instagram. You won't regret it. Um, and the other question a little bit about something you touched on that you know people return to their homes and they don't know what to expect uh, I, I've heard this in the media but it somehow disappeared more recently well, the kind of stuff that was left behind in occupied territories so you know uh, explosives specifically left behind in order to target civilians and kitchen cupboards that kind of stuff but also we hear stories of stuffed soft toys you know deliberately targeting civilian population in order to demoralize them. Um, can you just touch a little bit more on, on, on that, what we've seen in Ukraine and whether that's any difference to what you've experienced in other countries? Yeah, I'll start from Patron just because <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> now with Patron it's, um, so as a social behavior change communication person, Patron is tricky. So on the one hand, it's a fantastic product of SES, I don't want to call Patron product, he is a very nice dog, but um, 
it's, I mean, yeah, it's a deliberate character. It's a mascot of one of the Chernihiv demining squads from Sesso. Really lovely dog, really nice. Uh, he almost bite our program manager, but, um, <laughs> but you have to understand that it is to draw attention, as you rightly say, to the problem, not necessarily to educate about the right, um, about the right actions. And the, it, it is still super important because public support and popular like opinions towards SESU are very, SESU is State Emergency Service of Ukraine, like the main deminers who are not military basically. Um, it's very important to have trust and faith in them because a lot of, um, I don't want to say, okay, a lot of unsafe behaviors coming from uh, people losing faith in anything is gonna change. And I'm telling it over and over that comparing to many other countries, the government response is like absolutely outstandingly fantastic. So they are actually progressing on an unprecedented scale. I never saw anything like that as fast. But face is one thing and patron standing on an exploded ordinance is another thing. So uh, one of the core principles of social behavior change communication is don't send the mixed messages. So if you're saying, I don't know, don't touch, Grenades, don't hold this grenade in your hand. That's a very important part. And this is something that um, is very hard to get to the mind of military people, because that's exactly how they teach um, safety for military stuff. But there is a research that shows that you shouldn't actually do it if you actually want to influence people's behavior. So with Patron, uh, lovely mascot, fantastic idea, absolutely excellent implementation. And I think it's very important that Patron exist, but don't do as Patron. You also, it's a very light dog, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> don't do that. Um, on a very serious question of uh, deliberately left stuff, it's not really different from any other conflict. Uh, and it happens everywhere all over the world. I would say that the scale is, as I told in the very beginning, of scale of this is as unknown as the scale of contamination per se. So anecdotal evidence in social media, you can, there are like some case studies, but we don't know how often it is, where exactly, how many, like how, what was the intention, where, what was the context? Um, I mean, what can I say? It's an evil thing and it does happen, not different from other, from other, situations. Um, it is particularly different, difficult with booby traps and Ukraine has a very particular, I don't want to say culture, but we have this, uh, they call it rastyashka, it's basically like a hand grenade on a tripwire and there are numerous. This is what is probably different from many other conflicts that I saw because this thing is very popular but it's practically a landmine booby trap, call it whatever. But uh, this is a very particular distinct feature here. But again, not enough data, no landmine impact assessment, like no nothing. Our data is now very, very, very disorganized and very like occasional. But yes, it exists. No, we work mainly in like rural environment. So, and uh, what we see from social media so far, it was mainly urban environment. So, but yeah, the risks are immense and the harm to population is immense, but also we have to understand that teddy bear with explosive is not less, uh, not more dangerous than uh, cluster munition in the populated areas. And cluster munition is our one of the main preoccupations. Yeah. Yes.
So, yeah, thank you for the question. It's, um, so there are several aspects to it. First of all, it's a map not of contamination, but of casualties. And uh, into the casualties, you have <coughs> contamination as a factor, but also population movement as a huge factor. And here, like, you can clearly see that liberated areas near Kiev, it's basically where people are returning. Okay. So this uh, and again, mines, there are mines in Ukraine. There are a lot of mines in Ukraine. But mines are not the major threat. So cluster munition, artillery shells, so it's kind of mixed here. Um, like you can see the occasional um, exp like casualty, let's say, in Dnieper region, Zaporizhia. Like in Dnieper region, it's from cluster munition strike, for example. Like in Zaporizhia, it's, very, it's, it's where artillery, it's within artillery range, more or less. So it's, um, here it's, it's a lot about the movement dynamic of population. It's, it's really a lot about that. If we look at the contamination per se, and we have again social media, OSINT, whatever reports that south of Ukraine is getting mined, which gives us some indication. But do we know that it's getting mined or it's just like social media report or it's just like Russians want uh, audience to believe that it is mined or not, it doesn't say as much. There is almost zero data from uh, casualties on uh, occupied areas. So, and here you don't see casualties, uh, the old casualties from Donbass, because like Halo recorded them and it was more than 200,000 people since the beginning of the conflict, since 2014. Um, here you can see the big parts, it's where artillery worked. Because one thing is missile, like, they're pretty expensive weapon. They relatively seldom fail to detonate comparing to artillery range, mortar range, cluster munitions. So you can see, you can guess which weapons were used where, <laughs> basically, but it's like, it's speculation at this point because it's more casualties. Here it's clearly a return. Like, you can see the massive, massive return of population in Kiev because they think it's safe. But yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Um, why is it then, if you're saying obviously the things like Dnieper are clearly very emotional, do you not see that, how would you then stop the people who, if they're going to the point where they clear the land and build their homes as much as possible, it's going to be a very challenging area, how would that be prevented in the case of the So, Good thing that you mentioned the motion that they want to probe burning, but for our stuff, for example. And uh, like, I don't remember a percentage, but around 80% of our stuff are IDPs, either from Mariupol or Severodonetsk or Kramatorsk, which means that they're very traumatized people. They're like, they're doing their best. They're working on adrenaline. Halo is doing something in terms of mental health support, but you mentioned Bucha, and after visiting Bucha, a lot of them actually started taking the mental health session because it's very heavy. Um, with people and emotions, again, that's a thing with risk education. Um, it doesn't work 100%. Like we can't go with a autocracy scenario and say like, you know, if you cross this line, you're dead. We really can't, that's democratic state. And we as humanitarian actor, 100% can't do that. But um, there are ways, um, because what we do with risk education is basically to make sure that people have informed decision. That's first of all. So they know about the risk that they are there. They know about the consequences of uh, explosive ordnance that they are there. They know how to recognize them. They know that some of them you can't recognize if it's antipersonal landmine somewhere buried under the ground. There's no chance to see it, basically. So that's how, that's how the, 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 we have to make sure that people have all the information. They know how to report, for example. Um, important thing is here to, um, yeah, social behavioral change communication. So yes, we involve emotion. We involve stories, for example, of their neighbors who are coming back and then they behaved here and here. And we, like, when your teams are working on the ground, they collect like hundreds and thousands of those stories that are very good for you know, displaying certain behaviors. Um, we, and again, it's not gonna work 100% because people have attachment to this land. 
but basically we try to proactively offer solutions. So please call SESU um, State Emergency Service and make sure that your house was checked by the miners. Please don't check houses of your neighbors because they ask you while there wasn't checked by the miners and that's what people do like massively. Another thing is very important to, um, so we try to enable the safer preference. So like the whole idea of risk education is basically to make sure that people know that, that people consider the un relatively unlikely and I so much emphasize relatively because like out of, I don't know, there's no statistics of course, but like out of 1,000 people going into Bucha, like maybe two or five of them will actually get injured and will actually see an explosive ordinance. <coughs> so it's relatively unlikely, but on a scale of, you know, 40 million country, it's pretty high numbers. So we, we have to make sure that they are informed about all the risks and all the benefits and they have to assess what benefits will be for them. <coughs> and like, honestly, if you have a person who is dying of hunger and they have only a piece of bread in the world in this house, which is contaminated, I would really be surprised that they wouldn't go. And we have to accept that there is certain percentage of failure of our job because that's how social behavior change communication work. So we do our best, we try to measure it as best as we can. We try to make sure that people are enabled to make informed decision about their future. But uh, there are a lot of limitations, that's why demining is an actual answer and us is an actual, you know, like safety net while they are doing this demining. So that's on me. Hope to answer the question. Mm -hmm. But I mean, teenagers are still adults. That's the important part because like, I don't think you would want children to do any of these activities. But um, yeah, again, the best they inform, the, 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 best, the best information they have and then as adult personalities, they have to make an informed decision. Like in a context of conflict, like you have a lot of risks, right? You have going to army is a risk per se. Fighting is a risk per se. A lot of people still choose to do it for some motives or another motives. Similarly with uh, humanitarian work, like our teams are going to the field, well, I told the pretty traumatized people at some point, they're still going to the field to help people there. So they have to make sure that they have an informed decision about risks and potential benefits that they, they, that they or people around them would have. So it's, I mean, we have to accept the reality. It's never gonna be zero risk and <coughs> zero, zero tolerance, even with all the education in the world. I, did I? I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. So. That's a sad reality. <laughs> So usually it's done more on a ge geographical like scale, let's say. And uh, if we are talking about uh, urban areas, urban areas, at least like Bucha, Makariv, like Brovary, all these areas near Kiev, which I know a bit better, like a lot of ur urban areas are actually checked by SESU, which is fantastic. And people come, come back and actually returning and the clearance is actually done. You can see at least like a signs on a, on a houses that they were checked, you know, because like in many other contexts, and again, Syria is one of them, clearance is basically removing rubble from the road and then people go there and just on their own. That's not what happening in Ukraine. If people want to wait, not all of them want to wait. Um, big thing in terms of areas is, um, so it's easy, not easy, okay, not like that. So demining per se and humanitarian mining, humanitarian demining from humanitarian organization is of course prioritized as, as per the government, um, as per the government prioritization system. What's included there, big thing is return. Another big thing is like return of population in the urban areas specifically. Another big thing is agricultural activity. So this is all done in parallel. And when you look at the non-technical survey, usually it's done in like geographical area. It's not like, okay, we, we avoid these houses, we don't do NTS of the houses, uh, non-technical survey of the houses, but we do a non-technical survey of more or less a 
settlement, basically. So there is no prioritization in terms of this part. In terms of clearance, like Halo, I can speak like for Halo. There is a huge focus on uh, agricultural land because SESU are not, they don't, just, just don't have enough people to deal with it, basically, and the, we take on it. Like Halo is now working in Kiev region and now moving slowly to Chernihiv region and uh, Chernihiv area, it's all north of the country and potentially Sumy. Like there are a lot of areas which should be a priority in terms of casualties, like you, you see Kharkiv, for example, but there is no known to me mine action organization working there just because it's too dangerous. And nobody is knowing actually when the line of conflict is gonna change either way. And when we will have the story of Mirna Dolina, which is now like three years of work and it's all done basically. Three years of work, massive amount of money. And then the, the context change and, and that's it. So yeah, there is no prioritization urban rural, but there are prioritization based on need on civilian population. That's an important part. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I see the question. Like, I'm not an expert in a, anything related to the sea. I'm not nearby to be an expert. And humanitarian action deals with land mines, not sea mines. That's an important distinction. At the same time, uh, I'm not sure what you're talking about when you're talking about heavy resources, because basically what I understood from social media, and again, my halo hat is out. Like, I, they, they just basically do a corridor within this mines area which is not as heavy resourced as, as you would imagine. And like ec Ukrainian economic recovery grain, yes, but I, as a humanitarian, I do believe in our like responsibility to do it for humanitarian reasons because we have a obligation to feed the people, but at the same time we had obligation to feed the people, not sacrificing our own people <laughs> to the Russian Navy. And I, yeah, I can't, I, I can't comment on it at all, unfortunately, but yeah. I think you had a, there was a hand. Yeah. Um, first of all, well, yes, for two things. <laughs> One is, um, and by, by the way, there's a lot of academic projects that have been with for many years in my university, Kingston University here in, in, in London. Um, the reason I've been hacking away on my mobile phone is I've got something going with an engineer in Madrid at the moment. Um, and you probably know that um, that Polytechnic is one of the ones that have been doing stuff with Um, there's a lady engineer that's been on comment. Her reaction to the there's not you have not many women comment, which I, I picked up was kind of interesting because we all know about the whole of women in engineering. You know, I'm talking to a woman from the engineering degree. Um, and her first comment was, oh, but there, she knows plenty of people in, in the military, in the armed forces. Um, so you, you, you might like to comment. I mean, is it just that not enough people know the demand? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, coming to your question, it's, it's yes and no. There are a lot of technologies that are testing, in a process of testing, like remote sensing techniques and all of this when you're coming to an actual demining. Not many of them are actually deployed and for very, very like specific reasons. Because again, and I am not a high tech um, demining expert and I'm not demining expert per se, I'm an action expert, that's important part. <laughs> But like um, a lot of them are not deployed for, for very good reasons. Partly we have a very solid international mine action standards, which is a blessing because you have a certain standard to which all the land is assessed and cleared and techniques, safety procedures, so on and so forth. On the other hand, you have to incorporate these new techniques in these mine action standards, which are international mine action standards and we all abide, and it's it's very important part of it. With military, it's another thing. So Ukrainian military doing great job, but the job of the military in the war is to fight. So humanitarian mine action is not a priority. And that's where we are suffering a lot. And this is absolutely normal, because after the war, perfect. Like um, Jordan, for example, it's military-led mine action program, good. They're, as far as I know, they're not in a fight with anyone for some, for some time now. They have time for it. In Ukraine, in a very active war, army should fight. Everyone else should help su like release suffer of civilians during this conflict. And that's what we are doing. In terms of, so basically, like army should fight and it's their job. If they're doing something, it's good. But in principle, they're not, they are, they are, they are not the best equipped for that. Um, when it comes to recruiting, I mean, we are recruiting as much as we can locally. Like all the vacancies are constantly published and like we are growing like 100 people per month, which is immense. But again, techniques, fantastic. I, Halo is very open to any kind of research collaboration and we do some with some institutes. I would not remember it out of my mind, but I think we do some in, in the UK with some institutes, like some research collaboration. I know that some organizations are doing other types of research with drones and remote sensing. They tested in Africa, like I'm thinking about ICRC now, but they tested in Africa. It worked in some countries, it didn't work in other countries because different type of soil, different type of terrains and different, different technical aspects to it. Again, I'm not a demining expert, that's a very important part. Like I focus on humanitarian mine action as a whole. But in principle, we are very open to this collaboration. And as long as we collaborate with a civilian institution, including high, uh, high education institution, it's a, it, it can be very good. We can exchange contacts. That's definitely not a problem. Yes? So there is, there is a very important part, like we are now in a large scale emergency as per our standard. So HALO is now very preoccupied in getting there in the field and doing the job. It, with this said, it's very important to make sure that it's sustainable and uh, we are doing demining better and better and better. And uh, I, okay, I don't know from my side about such collaborations. I know about collaborations with CESU, for example, which is responsible government authority and I mentioned you can't do demanding research without collaboration with state emergency service. So in this way, yes. Um, right now in this moment, we are really preoccupied going to the field training teams and actually, you know, actually doing the job. At the same time, there is definitely a research component and we recently had our research and development manager coming in the country. I see your point and I believe that we can do better in a collaboration with uh, local um, organizations and local researchers. At the same time, demining is pretty straightforward at some point. I'm not sure like what exactly research do you mean? Like what, what, what kind of techniques are developing? 
because there are several new techniques which should be tested, trialed, and as I mentioned, international mine action standards is our Bible. This is a very important part, and uh, we can't guarantee the clearance of the land with innovative techniques unless they are fully trialed and approved. And it's a similar, you can compare it to the development of the um, medicine. So majority of the medicines that we are taking now, apart from probably COVID vaccine, it takes years and years to develop, test, and trial. And here the cost of mistake is like, there is no such thing as like almost no mind and like 90% effectiveness. It shouldn't be such thing. So this is this is challenging part. But again, if you have contacts here, you like it. Would, I would be very happy to pass it to people who are actually dealing with it. Yes. How is the new mind good for people who had safe uh, good tools? Obviously, we just talked about the need to use access to the areas and move on. New mind uh, where fighting is happening, but do you see you know your point scale your current approach and scaling up? Sorry, before you answer, maybe if there's any other questions, because I think we'll finish in about three or four minutes, so yeah, we can, we can collect several. them all together, but I think yeah. last moment. Okay, okay. Well, that's the <laughs> last one. Uh, <laughs> that's a very good question to end. <laughs> Without proper assessment, we can't name the scale. So this is very important to understand, because there are a lot of speculation oh, we need to demine half of Ukrainian territory, oh, not actually demine, but clear, and people don't know these technicalities, you know? And you know, when, when I read the, when I did, like, I basically asked myself, because it's a very obvious question, how long will it take? And there are, um, there are some myths, I would say, that says like one year of fighting is 10 years of uh, clearance, whether it's true, I never found any confirmation to this information. Sorry, like zero, never. Everyone keeps repeating it since I joined Mine Action in 2016, but like n nobody ever pointed me out, like how, how did you get to this number? Um, so it's, whatever I say, it's gonna be a speculation. What I can say right now, that what we do, we work now in, uh, so northeast of Kiev, two like relatively small rions, it's like Buchansky, like Bucha and surrounding areas and Brovary, two tiny, like not tiny, tiny, but relatively small rions. And we estimate that if we work, says to work, whoever else would enter and work, it would take us many, many months to finish there. So like clearance per se is a very slow process like in some, it depends on terrain, of activity, whatever. Like in Afghanistan, we had like sometimes six meters per, so one deminer in a lane, let's say, he, he or she, that's important distinction. Um, like in some terrains, like challenging ones, they can do like up to six meters per day. Sometimes they can do two meters per day, and this is a progress. And we have like, again, estimation to survey, not to clear, but still it's like, it's 300,000 square kilometers, which is like unimaginable scale. So there is a huge work for everyone. We have to again accept that at some point we would reach, there is this problem of uh, uh, one million dollar mine because like when the contamination is immense, your progress is relatively fast, you save the most life in this beginning, let's say, because you remove 80% of, you know, this Pareto kind of rules. but when we move forward, it will be like, still we need to demine this land because people have to have access to this land. And it's very tricky because that's where behavior science comes in place in actual demining. Because when people believe that there is mine there, one mine, they will not go to that field and they will not use this area. It's, they might be no mine, but until we verify it, people would not reach this area. It can happen, in many cases people would reach, in many cases it will be an accident. But like, we have to understand that at some point we will reach the level of, you know, relatively low risk. And I don't want to speculate about years, but when the conflict is over, it's gonna be years, but it's not gonna be like, hopefully, centuries, let's hope. But like, again, you have to understand that in the UK, for example, and the Netherlands, when they do this underwater cables, they have an EOD guy, explosive or disposal guy on watch now for the Second World War, explosive remnants of war. 
So, and there is a big deal, and from time to time you hear this big bombs find like somewhere. And it's been like, what, one, almost 100 years right now, more or less. So like, we will have this problem forever because once land is contaminated, you can fix it, but it's, it's still like there. But at the same time, we have to reach this level when there's like almost no people in the UK are dying of explosive ordnance from Second World War. And this is basically where we are trying to get in all other countries and uh, somewhere more successful, somewhere less. Like even Afghanistan, last moment, right? Last mm -hmm. second, good. Even Afghanistan, like now majority of accidents that are happening there are from uh, improvised explosive devices which are recently planted by any actor. Not by Soviet landmines anymore. They're still by Soviet landmines. And been, it's been like 20 years now, but they are very, very few comparing to the numbers that we saw in the beginning of mine action program in 1988. So again, not gonna be ideal, but gonna be tolerant so that people can like relatively safely and be confident in the land that they use. This is pretty at it. And with this saying like just, um, one final word probably from me. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Emily, for uh, moderating it. And thank you, Alessia and Ukrainian Institute of London for hosting this event. I think it's super important. And I know a lot of people want to watch it. And I think we have to talk about Ukrainian problems, Ukrainian mine action, Ukrainian whatever humanitarian action, because this awareness is like, it shouldn't fade in, the, in, the, in, in other areas. And we have to understand that if Ukraine is not on the headlines, it doesn't mean that nothing has happened there because a lot is happening there. But also, even if, even when nothing is gonna happen in there, we will still have a problems of landmines for year and years to come. We will still have a problems of people injured and uh, people in need for support for years and years to come. So this is, this is very pessimistic note. <laughs> Probably I want to finish. But uh, I think that uh, we are doing tremendous tremendously good job as a country as much as we can in humanitarian mine action as good as we can. So yeah, thank you all for coming and thank you for your interest in this, uh, in this topic. Mm -hmm.